Right, our next speaker is Jason. He's coming down from London, and I really appreciate you taking the time, especially as he's just started a new job, uh, has user experience and product strategy at Plan. Um, so, um, Jason has worked at a ton of places. Um, if you know anything about the health industry, Jason's been for a long time and worked at RMA and teams, um, and uh, all sorts of places. Um, but tonight's talk will be uh, appropriate enough about ways it starts to work out. So, it's about the confluence of the digital um, services, um, the physical products, and how the team is produced. So, over to you, Jason.
the, the makers are kind of like very much kind of on the experimental edge, trying to kind of touch on the emotions and kind of make provocations, uh, maybe connecting with, with other disciplines and, and doing a lot of making and prototyping, which is all very valid and very interesting. Um, and, I, and I spoke to Andy about this today and just to kind of see what he thought about it. He, just, he said, well, I'm sure there's a lot of people doing this, but that, you know, maybe it's because the people in our industry, the people that we follow on Twitter, the people that we see at conferences, they're more open about their talking about these things. And maybe there's lots of people out there doing work in this space still. And maybe they need a voice, maybe they need a channel to communicate. And I think that's kind of one aspect of what I'd like to see going forward. Um, so certainly there's an aspect of this maturity. We're going from um, the Internet Toaster, which was actually a project that was in my uh, final year at university back in 2001. Robin Southgate actually made a toaster that communicated with the internet and burned on um, a piece of weather onto the toast. So it worked back then. Um, going through your baker tweaks and your good night lamps and all the way to kind of more your Fitbits and connected devices of now. So we are kind of maturing in this world. And I think that's very useful. We're getting more products and things that kind of living in our household, going more mass. So we're having a physical device, a digital service, and these things are talking to each other. There might be device interactions on the box, there might be interactions on an application, there might be a website, a desktop application as well. It's all distributed kind of interfaces, inputs and outputs. Even kind of interesting with Evernote, that they're teaming up with people, whether it's 3M for the post-its, or whether it's uh, Molsky for their notebooks, and finding ways to basically kind of fuse this, you know, not necessarily a product per se, but actual physical objects, and connect them with our digital world. Because people love this tactility. This tactility is really good, but it's a real problem um, to kind of like, you know, store all this information. You never know, it's fantastic, it's storing information. Um, to, uh, maybe more niche, but um, these guys, I love these guys, it's called Teenage Engineering, it's sort of, kind of consultancy, industrial design consultancy, who make this OP1 mini synthesizer I'm obsessive about music tech, so it's, it's amazing. But this is an old classic design of a speaker, but it's what they've done is updated it and kind of connected it to a kind of, you know, it's basically like a sonar system, but it's a really fucking good speaker. And it really connects well, and you've got this idea of an application and also a connected little remote that would go alongside it. And these are very, very simple things. Um, so much more complex. I love this piece of work. Um, I wish there was, there was more to, to, to show and to see. But um, Native actually did some work for Text Instruments. It's a bit of a concept piece, but it brought to life. And anyone who's worked in automotive user interface um, would kind of understand the challenges there. We were actually at IXDA London, which I'm at. Um, a local leader for, we're doing an event next uh, October 30th, if you come to check out to London to talk about this thing. What traditionally happens is the car manufacturers have this kind of chassis and they have a dashboard and now they've got LCD screens. And they're like saying, well, we've got these controls to manipulate these screens, maybe you can have a touch screen, but that's your, that's your space, here's your control. And they're completely on different kind of uh, plot cycles or cadences for de development. And so by the time the car comes to market, this touch screen or whatever is around it is completely out of date. And the car's got to last for 10, 15 years. It's really, really, really screwed up. So, I mean, this doesn't completely solve it, but what is interesting is that the controls, the actual touchscreen is, um, it's not just a touchscreen, but actually the controls are kind of modal, but you have a tactile quality to them. So the different modes you're in kind of affect what that central button will do. So it's kind of using this interface in a slightly different way. Um, but obviously we know these sorts of things. I'm not gonna go to the, you know, describe what we already know about that sort of stuff. Um, at Plan, I've just started, they do a lot of work around trends and what's going on through kind of, you know, true trends, social, economical, technological ones to design trends and all sorts of things. And, you know, they pen this Internet of Things as a, a key meta trend, but there's these two key um, kind of design technology trends um, that are happening here, which, you know, you could equate to all these Internet of Things connected devices, and that's around, you know, smart systems, so things that have an intelligence, maybe that's automatic intelligence or, you know, derived from explicit interaction like the Nest or whatever. Um, to this other aspect of a hardware revival where people are kind of deciding to, to re-engage and, and re-bond with products because they're not all that bad. So, what, what's interesting and what was, I was discussing when I was thinking about joining Pan, I was like saying, well, you know, we're coming up with this, 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 this thing, this service that we're going to offer, but it, it's kind of talking about helping organisations who get physical products and work physical products and understand digital a little bit better. Whereas if you're on the digital side, you know, maybe you, could, you don't really understand what it takes to go to market and go into production. So how do you get over to understanding how you get into the physical side? 
So um, for me, there's like these two forces coming together. And there is a third one where people are just doing this together right from, from the get-go. So the, the jawbones of this world and, and people like Nest, etc. And they all need different types of help, but they're kind of people who are born from a lot of experience, if that's example. But this is, this is the real key issue, I believe, in, in all of this sort of stuff. Is I believe there's a lack of skills for this future ahead um, in the types of people, the things that we're hearing about. Um, I'm really worried about this wearable stuff. I mean, wearables have been talked about for a long, long time. I have visions of, like, you know, an arm full of bracelets and watches and stuff. And, you know, it wasn't enough, really. Uh, I wonder how sustainable this is, or is this just transient phase? So, you know, how much of a dick do you look like when you wear these glasses? And, and it's an obvious thing, and you can concentrate on the fact that the screen is here and all these sorts of things. But, you know, you've got to understand that there's a, there's a cultural uh, aspect to having a device on your head. It's like having the, you know, the headsets for kind of your mobile phones. I mean, you look idiotic a lot of the time. And this matters, right? This matters to people that are buying products. And I think so Google didn't grasp at all. So, um, interesting, like, you know, I love the idea of the little printer. It's really great. I, I got one straight away. I had nightmares setting it up. This whole internet thing is that there's a whole issue around setting things up. It's a real challenge. But I haven't used it for a while. Yes, the proposition is still forming, which is odd because a product would have a real clear proposition if it's going to market. Yeah, it's kind of people ask, well, what's it for? Go, well, that's coming. So, okay. Okay, I haven't used it for a while. So, um, and uh, but what, when I was talking to product designers, they absolutely hate this sort of stuff. They, um, they think it's really flimsy, really fragile, doesn't last, it's really quirky, it won't fit in people's homes. It doesn't really sit in the cultural context of the way the mass will, will live. So uh, I think it's a really interesting idea, and I, I, I applaud Berg in many respects, but I think this is it's an interesting example of maybe this isn't the way things should be. And uh, an obsession with these glowing rectangles, the answer it seems, and in any brainstorming, usually comes down to, well, we're going to have a touchscreen, right? Because that's the future of distraction. Okay, well, you know, many people have talked about this, this issues of kind of tactility, working through bars and all sorts of things, but, but we haven't got any great alternative right now. They're very bespoke. So, you know, clients, consumers are all asking for touchscreens all the time, so we just keep on giving them touchscreen, except they're never as good as an Apple touchscreen. So, you know, we have problems. So, you know, there's a proliferation of that stuff. And I think one of the most interesting things which we're kind of realising are people who are kind of thinking, Oh, make this physical product. Well, fantastic. They're on that first step to thinking it's not just a digital service. Make a tactile manifestation of it. That's a really interesting thing. But, you know, go on to Kickstarter. We'll just test these ideas out, see what happens. You can get something like a pebble, and then, shit, we've got to build this thing. Something goes wrong. <coughs> this guy, Robert Gunner, who's, who likes to talk about how he was the one who hired Johnny Ive and then got pushed out. Um, he talks about hardware being appropriately named. It's really hard to do it. And yes, he, he acknowledges that software is really hard. But the problem is, is that pain gets much worse to change um, when you go further down the life cycle with, with the products. You, you can't just, once it's gone to market, you can't easily change the products. Maybe components of it, but you can't shift it all of a sudden. Um, you recall, you know, getting things in the papers and say, you've got to send this back. I mean, it's not easy. So there's these skills and stuff that are going on, and the, you know the people that the, the UX and digital technology conferences will be talking about, and all these things. But I think there's some fundamental things uh, missing. One's around understanding the physical form, um, understanding the materials and the manufacture process, the logistics, the supply chain. I was talking earlier tonight with um, with a few folk around um, this this notion of just thinking beyond screens is something that UX folk really struggle with, really really struggle with. Generally. Um, creating products that last. These aren't just transient things all the time. These are things that maybe someone will love, that they're you know, going to last 10, 15, 20, 50 years. And that's very different from what we're used to. We'll just do something lean, get it out, test it, see, change it, whatever. And that's maybe appropriate for a lot of software services, but certainly not for physical things in the future. And it's a really good appreciation of consumer culture, which I think that you know, user experience, people maybe get users and that particular thing, but I don't think they get consumer culture as well as maybe others. So these are some challenges and you know, I'm willing to be challenged back on that. One of the things, and I've talked about this, and, and just bear with me because I use product design and industrial design interchangeably. I mean, 
Uh, the idea of industrial design being called industrial design is it's really just designed for industry and designed for manufacture, but it's kind of using to change things, so I apologise for that. It doesn't make anything any clearer, but just assume when I say product will be industrial. Um, so this is my new boss. He writes in the course so he's a really good, really bright guy, works on products for a long, long time. Um, and he talks about, he was saying, like, you know, but product design, what's really different about them is they take a very holistic view of uh, problem solving through technology and aesthetics in a cultural context, which I thought was a great line. I'd really like to unpick that some more because I don't necessarily agree that user experience people don't do that completely. I don't think it's necessarily the domain of product designers, but it's a really good point. But they do get these things, you know, they do get physical form, they do understand materials manufacture, they do think beyond the screens um, when they can, and they try, they, they've been accustomed to thinking about products that last and they get consumer culture. Ian back again, he was talking about a year and a half ago um, uh, over at breakfast, was saying um, you know, that basically industrial designers just have their head in the ground. They see all this stuff, they dismiss them to things and they say, it's just a crap problem. They don't think about what the implications are of it. So there was a problem for industrial product designers in this world. You know, he, Ian goes on to say, they still hold up rams and eaves as their heroes. And if you see the products, you can kind of understand why. They're beautiful, last, long lasting things. These things, they still co I covet all these objects, by the way. I can't afford them, but they, they're great. Um, but, but they still hold these people up as their heroes. Um, I, I, I quote myself, that's what <laughs> um, And uh, I, I said this recently at our product design conference, because you know, you go down well better than maybe here. But um, it's a company. Uh, I, I honestly think that we spend so much time talking because we like to we are open and we're eloquent. We, we can construct models and talk about all these things. We, we don't really talk about our work that much. Um, and so we hold up these, these, these heroes of ours. And, and they may well be fantastic people at what they do. They are really bright, really intelligent people. And, and I like a lot of them there. Um, but we seem to follow what they say and tweet it and it becomes kind of like wide knowledge, even though we haven't seen the update of what they do, we haven't lived with their products for a while. And it, it's, just, it's just interesting the kind of comparison between what we hold up as our for people to, to believe in and what um, others do. Interesting, Dave Cronin, who um, is ex-Cooper, he wrote, uh, he co-wrote about phase three, went smart design, um, and then is now GD. He talked about this thing around me, he was talking about the fact that you know, it was great working at Smart because he had a problem, he gets some industrial designers in the room and then he's sketching shitloads of solutions, like 10 times as many as the UXers who would be going, but why? And who's this for? And you know, useful questions, you know, no disability, but there was this kind of crazy talent that these, these people would just work through it in a very different way. And through my experience, I've been totally sympathised with this. Generally, UXers, because they come from different backgrounds, they're not necessarily being, being taught to think like a designer. And there's aspects of design thinking the process that I think we lack talking about um, through our work. Um, and Ian talks about the fact that actually industrial design can taught us a lot of what we know through design process. Uh, and Steve Taylor, a guy who's ex-industrial designer um, and uh, works in interaction design for the hour, so the product and interaction again. Um, he was talking to me the other day about the fact that, you know, it teaches a lot about process industrial design. You go through a good, strong methodology when you do things, you learn from doing, it's the whole 10,000 hours you can intuitively thin slice through things. A lot about, you know, the things which ultimately I've always believed that um, a design, an industrial design process kind of teaches you a good user sense of one. But his, his view is maybe similar to, to kind of what, what, what I believe in, in the sense that, um, you know, maybe, because they're not coming to us, they're not coming to us and go, that oh, they're the printing, it's probably something better. Maybe we've got to go to them, maybe we've got to find a way to help give them a better voice. So we've got to pull and kind of get into their space and try and understand them some more. Which I think is interesting um, and possibly a way forward. So, so, I don't know, given that setup, I'd be interested is, 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 I don't know how to do it, but is, does this make sense? Do you find this offensive? Does anyone agree? Does anyone disagree? <laughs> Stick your hand up if you disagree with anything I said. It's a challenge, isn't it? So you're basically saying you're not good at, at these certain things, and that's why I think it's particularly interesting about this, and possibly something to explore a bit more. Right, so yeah, not, not so good at like, the industrial design. Yeah, yeah. Why is it these guys are so better at ideation, ten times better than as at ideation? That's I think it's just because they, you know, for one of the people who was discussing this recently, I, was just, I think it's just because they just do it. 
They've just done it. They've just done more of it. They're, they're not doing all aspects of the process all the time, but they, when they get to I don't know. I don't know. It's a, and there's something like yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, Gavin Wyatt is the advocate of having an industrial design background. Mm. Uh, he says it makes you very artist as well. Uh, I agree. But it's the process. That's, it's an it's a old discipline that has uh, some core artisan skills. Mm. And we're, you know, we're just a soon come Johnny who are kind of are learning along the way. Mm. Uh, we can learn a lot from them. But are we not dealing with a whole new medium that is much more, much more complicated in yeah. certain aspects? Digital is new. Um, physical products, you can see them, you can smell them, you can lick them. You know, digital stuff is kind of unknown, it's been only around for uh, well, for now. Really unknown, but it's also more permissive. Like, you can run a bad card and people want to <coughs> use it, and it's like you're not going to pass that test. If it's not a bad service, people are more likely to go around. Yeah. And it's not, yeah. yeah. And there's very few things we would hold up as great, because they, you know, they are, they change so much. And, yeah, I, I think all those points are true. I, t I totally agree. You know, it's more complex. We we are in early stages. We're all somewhat amateurs in this, and that's why it's just funny when people just kind of claim to be experts in it. I think you can have an expert perspective as long as you're happy to change that view. But I think, like, it, it just comes to the fact that you know, okay, there's going to be aspects of a product design that we might be conceiving ideas around, and we're going to have this thing. It's going to sit on a desk, going to sort of screen. We're like, oh, well. Maybe there's something else. So, so I've got a few possible ways in which we can maybe think about how we can better interleave ourselves or whatever in, into this. So I'd be interested to see if we can kind of develop this further. The main one, I'd just like to talk through the differences and, and I don't want to make this necessarily an education thing. I just think it's just interesting to understand this more because I'm learning more about this again through having not studied it for like 12 years and seeing lots of it around in, in the work I plan. Um, way, way long ago, I, I did this thing model which was trying to model what's the perfect user experience person and it was used for kind of various recruitment affairs for ages. Most of the skills were soft skill things, so they weren't really hard skills. So it goes back to, you know, not necessarily having disciplines in what we do. But then I also used this model of this sort of on the left and I uh, created an extension on the right, which is kind of uh, what I call the you know, four disciplines of user experience and talking about experience strategy, so you can see what the right product is, user research, design research, market research, you know, IA as library science, IA as website UX, and interaction design as embedded um, device interaction stuff and software, and you know, get people to draw shapes because you know, user experience design, interaction design, whatever you call yourself, the title is irrelevant, the things and what you're good at are more relevant. And so people really like that model. I'll try to extend it from a more visual perspective. Um, and the VP is because graphic language, uh, I'm involving that one. It starts out with lots of graphics and then um, I've had as a provocation to visual designers to say, give me something better, and they didn't. So I've been involving it uh, to more graphic language with us. Um, but I wonder whether there's a way to do this with industrial design that might help us interact with those guys better. And it's interesting because we're talking to people and they don't have a set view. And maybe that's because, you know, there's a little bit of the IA in me in that shape, a very little one, that basically wants to codify it. And they go, uh, uh, okay, let's talk about this. It's quite interesting. Okay, never thought about this in 15 years. Um, interestingly, a lot of people <coughs> tell me that, that, you know, people got into the product industrial design through a, a love of cars and styling and want to do cool cars. And so, um, you know, still automotive design is the kind of most outrageous, cool, cool things, I suppose, if you like, you know, making cool shapes. Um, so they focus on that. And, and uh, Raymond Lowy, who's an like, old classic industrial designer, was very famous for doing kind of these, these things. I think he was responsible for the, like, the fins on the old uh, cars and stuff, and, you know, kind of very aerodynamic looking trains. They weren't functional, the aerodynamic, they just looked faster, and that was really important. Um, but it goes all the way down to like, you know, the styling has matured um, into things like we were talking about product language. There's a really strong affinity with, you know, brands with this, that you kind of notice that, that like if you're at a product level, at a range level, there's similarities, but they're all slightly different. They're not completely consistent, but they're coherent. And there's an interesting thing that in good product industrial designers, they kind of implicitly get that product language stuff. Um, but it's really worrying, they, they really struggle, and people are really good at that, this, just like constantly being told, that's not important, that's not important, what we need to do is solve world hunger, what we need to do is solve the economy, it's, you know, using design thinking to solve any problem, and, and arguably you can use design thinking and processes to contribute to any problem, but still, styling product language really still matters in this world, especially when it's product. Um, and so they're kind of obsessed about the physical 
the physical form, thinking about you know aesthetics, making a product understandable, unobtrusive due to RAMs. But they, you know, this is starting codifying this, but we're thinking about ergonomics, so how it fits, um, how it feels, the weight of it, the rigidity of it, really important. You think about MacBook Air versus like a creepy plastic, um, some other companies, that thing. Um, and, uh, you know, all these other things, the proportions, the way something might stand, all these things have an effect on your perception of that product. And they, they talk about this CMF all the time, and I was like, Oh yeah, colour material finish, that's a really key thing they talk about. So a lot about colour trends and, um, and how that works through to the material and the finish. And there's people who specialise in CMS. There you go, not CMS. Slightly, slightly different. <laughs> um, but you know, just to kind of show you something around this kind of idea of you know, intimate understanding of materials and manufacturing, this is, um, uh, I'll show you a video so this is a from uh, Objectified, where, where Johnny and I are just obsessed about this, which is a, which is a fantastic video. And so this is a this is an aluminium extrusion that goes through multiple um, operations, most of them CNC machined operations, to end up uh, to end up with this part. And so you can see, I mean, just a, a dramatic sort of transformation between this raw blank and the final part. But what we end up with is a part that's got um, all of the, the mounting features, so all of the bosses, they're all this, this, this is just one part. And this one part is, is providing so much functionality. Um, and this one part really does, does enable this product. So you're, you know, so much of the effort behind a product like the MacBook Air was experimenting with different processes. It, you know, there's a completely non-obvious, but the way that you hold, you know, to get from this part to this part, that there are an incredibly complex series of fixtures to hold this. And it's so funny when you hear me talk about it, you start to get obsessive about the manufacturing process, you know, even more so than the end product sometimes. Because he realises that to do that is, is very much, you know, he needs to kind of crack these other things. And, you know, things like the iPhone and MacBook Air and all these sorts of things, their, their feet in not so much the styling themselves, because lots of people can easily conceive of that, but actually in just that delivery of that, that thing. It's like any you know, good you know, UX designer or whatever will know to make, make sure they can come up with good content that can be built you know, on the site. Otherwise, it's just a piece of you know, crap on a paper, <coughs> brown paper or something, or something. It's never going to go anywhere. So uh, it's a really interesting book, which is fascinating if you're, if you're interested in just having a look. It's got things like, you know, basic carpentry joints as well, so you could do, use it around your house. But uh, a book and a whole series of things around manufacturing processes for design professionals um, by a guy called Rob Thompson. And he talks about all the different materials and different processes from injection molding to milling and all sorts of things in relative approaches. It's fascinating. Um, but, uh, you know, I kind of come back to this point around this, uh, you know, Good industrial design has always been good user centered design. So, people like Henry Dreyfus and um, I can't remember the first name of the present working around designing for people and doing a lot about physical ergonomics. And this from a body um, space, I think, but, which is anthropometric uh, measurements for um, you know, sitting, standing, kneeling, all these different things and kind of understanding you know, the size things, but also down to you know, fingers and grips. And these things all have an effect on the EPS areas and all this stuff that we need to understand. And, and graft, and you know, all this stuff is available. It's just really fascinating, really useful. Someone spent a long time codifying it for. Um, the other thing is just around, and I'm, I'm sorry to go over, but you know, there's a view that industrial have to design for a future that's way, way beyond um, what is now, way beyond when it's released. And, and that time is changing from the manufacturing processes getting more accelerated. But you know, there's, there's things like kind of having these more active, like key concepts and this is Seymour Powell's um, air cruise, which is like a flying cruise ship, um, which is just an amazing video if you watch it. I mean, completely mad, but it's obviously for 50 years time. And they're kind of going into all the detail thinking about it, which is really valuable. But even down to something like the Lexus, um, when the Lexus was introduced, I think it was by Toyota, they decided in 1983 they were going to do this thing. And by 1989, six years, they can develop, develop a, um, a car for the market. And, you know, by 91, it was the number one important brand. They played a real long game to develop that. You know, they had 4,000 R&D staff working on it. Six years to develop, so big bets. These companies are making huge bets. You know, one, one to three billion dollars. And it paid off for the time being. Um, and then it's gone down. 
Um, so, you know, often I remember being taught about this idea of in order to get to B, where you want to head to, you need to leave forward to Z and then come back to B. And it's kind of a really interesting conceptual model to use in your design process. Um, uh, I won't go on about it, but yeah. Uh, at my university, I, did, I um, was touching on this idea of uh, E8 because it was a kind of nascent concept and it was due to come out in a couple of years from, from that point. So about 10 years ago, I went to do power already. And this idea of you know, my main point here is not just that I invented this stuff, it's actually because I didn't do the hard work of bringing it to market or thinking it's a really good idea, whatever. It was just the fact that you know, designers and colleges that were coming up with things that were way ahead, that were kind of useful for now, but 15 years ago. Um, I don't see the same actually at the moment in colleges, unfortunately, but um, it's, just, it's just something to bear in mind. Um, so, uh, yeah. That industrial stuff can do amazing renderings and stuff, but they can also draw a bit looser, I mean, this is still beautiful, but they can draw looser and contextually like um, like we should be as well as a screen head of concepts, not all you know, beautiful hand renderings. Um, but they've always like made models. I, I remember really understanding the design of the first time, my second year of my course, and I actually spent lots of time making hundreds of phone models, and I totally understood design at that point because I was just like, okay, you need to create something in this new you need to kind of iterate. And it's very similar to the pro pro stuff, this is actually. Plan's first project when they're doing something for the Orange Simply Fund, and they did the big prototyping and um, factor of the plants. So, uh, my main kind of patience is probably where I'll probably end is just to say, you know, there's this idea in industrial design, there's maybe these, these things around product language, materials manufacture, product visualization, so kind of rendering and coming up with these things, and there's certainly obviously some human factors that can sit alongside, you know, the skills of user experience people, whether that's motion graphics to information design. They share these, these things around maybe experience strategy and user research. We, we both do them in different aspects. Um, but maybe there's these links, some links between product language and graphic language, visualization and maybe interaction design, ergonomics cuts across IA, interaction design, all sorts of things. So maybe we can think about kind of some of the overlaps there and how we can, can, can come together through that. Um, I'll leave it to the point that industrial design has been struggling to articulate the value of the work, whereas UX is kind of starting to win on that front. So Jim at the Alloy, he can sell the extra stuff really easily in industrial design what the Alloy is famous for much harder these days. Um, and they're all obsessing over the touchscreen again. So they have to end up doing the touchscreen a lot of the time. It's really hard to push against that uh, when people are asking for a solution. All they want from the case is just something cheaper. Um, so I think that's a real problem because these things will last you get kind of Kindles that kind of really cheap things. Or I, I just bought a, a cheaper EU than, than a Kindle. Um, but they will know than an iPad that's on a tablet, just so I could have my kid play with it and potentially break it, so not worry too much about it. Um, but the other interesting thing Kevin talks about is that you, in Dutch design, you see the code fine stuff and crazy models and frameworks and talking about psychology and quantum biases and things and, and that sort of thing. And they struggle, so maybe that's one way we can help. And um, maybe they're less vocal kind of, and confident about what we do, and that's again something we could, we could help them with. Uh, I try and kind of reset this balance so it's not so much about the digital service because I believe the physical product will matter more. And, you know, we can adapt our skill sets and think about which ones, which parts of the model we want to grow in, maybe, and understand. We need to think about that. To maybe just think about whether it's 3D. There's a really interesting debate around, you know, Ian believes that everyone should go to more than 3D. It's kind of like, you know, imposter, everyone should pay. Very much of a 3D app. It's another skill that we should, everyone should learn. Um, whereas uh, Alex, who works at Pan, a uh, really fantastic furniture designer, and his day, and his, um, his day uh, in his evenings, uh, you know, he's talking about uh, there's enough people who can kind of make shapes and stuff, it's more than the shapes. And so, you know, there's a decided kind of going to frame models rather than necessarily going into 3D CAD, people spend a lot of time. Um, and a uh, notion of reorganising design schemes, maybe it's a case of you know putting it on like Johnny Ivan chart. But actually, this, this is happening more. And I'm seeing it more on the product side. I've got more product industrial designers over the top of UXs. Um, and, and I think that's maybe a good kind of move given the lack of talent in the marketplace. There might be more people who can manage that. But then people like David Show at 12, he's kind of from a graphic design and interaction design. He's looked after industrial designers as well. So maybe there's, there's others there that kind of reverse that model. So it's an organisational thing, the that's and skill sets thing. Um, but maybe then there's just ways which we can work together rather than parallel at the start, but we'll work out how we can how can afford that versus, you know, is user experience first and industrial design, industrial design user experience, or do we have mutual directors that can kind of get involved, have a good understanding of the breadth and then 
kind of hide that off. So these are all questions in my mind. Who decides the balance of you know, the physical and the digital? What, what ways can we come together? What ways can we learn from each other? And this isn't even a problem that we need to solve. So um, thank you, I'm sorry for that.